So good morning to those of you who are in the meeting and also those who will be watching the video later on. Um, I hope this session has something practical that you can take away from it. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity, Analda and the rest of the Empower team for uh, the opportunity to bring this to you. Okay, so today's session is um, I'm going to be doing most of the talking and then Analda will also have a part of the session a bit later on to show you the open refine tool, which I think is going to be very useful to a lot of people, especially those who work with um, spreadsheet types of setups and spreadsheet like data. I think that's going to be very useful. So thank you very much for showing that a bit later on Analda. All right, um, then for those of you who don't know me, I should probably introduce myself. I am Marissa Chrysel, and I'm the project manager for the UNISA node of Sadilar. So at the UNISA node, which is situated within the Department of African Languages, we are currently working on developing African word nets and also linguistic terminology for use in university classrooms. Um, so my background is mostly in computational linguistics. I studied computational linguistics at the Northwest University a million years ago. Um, and my interest is very much in developing these types of tools and resources for the South African languages. Um, and I have a passion for giving information to people in their own language uh, via these tools and the resources that we are developing. I think in South Africa, that is one of the greatest gifts you can give someone is to communicate with them in their own language. Okay, so today's session will follow on from the previous two sessions, um, and we will look a bit further at analysis of data. But before I get into that, perhaps I can just again reiterate that the escalator has a code of conduct and you can read the full code of conduct at the link provided. But it is basically a call for you to be a nice human, allows, allow others to be nice humans, uh, all opinions are valid and to be mindful and respectful of others in the session and in the community as a whole. Just to situate this session within the others, uh, I will share again the slide from the 101 innovations that you've seen in the previous sessions. So we've dealt with preparation now, uh, where you define your research priorities, you get organized in your team, and you also get funding. Then the previous session focused on discovery, where you start searching for your literature, you get access to um, different databases, uh, and you start reading and viewing and also annotating what you are reading for your purposes. So that is where you start, uh, you start wide, you start reading wide, and you get narrow and you start narrowing that down to your specific research problem in the discovery phase. Then by the time you get to the analysis phase, which is where we will focus today, then you should already have a very clear idea of your research pro um, problem and the exact research questions that you want to answer. And this is where you start getting practical with it. So this is um, in essence where you collect, mine, and extract your data, or you do your experiments. And then also, this is the phase where you share your protocols, notebooks, workflows, and also where you analyze your data. So the analysis phase can really be broken down into three shorter phases, if I can call it that. Uh, the first one, collecting and extracting and experimenting. So you are creating data, as it were. Then the second one, it's important to note where you will share all of this discovery that you are making. And the third mini phase within analysis is the work that you do with this data and how you manipulate it and what you put into writing, which is the phase that follows this one. Okay, so let's have a closer look at what exactly is analysis. And I have two definitions on the screen there. Um, 
to analyze means to break a topic or concept down into its parts in order to inspect and understand it and to restructure those parts in a way that that makes sense to you. In an analytical research paper, you do research to become an expert on a topic so that you can restructure and present the parts of the topic from your own perspective. So when I did my master's study, my study leader told me that this is after you've read everything, you should do a mother summary. And this is the summary that you can give to your mother in one page, and they will be able to understand what you want from uh, the study. So it's in very plain language. It's very easily written um, and very short, concise, but you should be able to explain to anybody in your family who has no idea what you are doing. And then the social sciences, we often get blank stares um, on exactly what we are doing in our research. Um, and you should be able to give it in your own words and in your own perspective. Then the second um, definition on the screen there, there are multiple ways to make sense out of data. The method you choose depends on the questions you're asking and the information you're looking to get from your data set. If you want to explain what has happened and why, then descriptive and diagnostic analytics will come in handy. If the questions relate more to what could happen in the future, you want to use predictive and prescriptive analytics. And you can read both of the blog posts where I got those um, definitions from at the links provided. In the second definition, I want to highlight the fact that um, the, the sentence that says the method you choose depends on the questions you're asking and the information you are looking to get from your data set. So this already implies that you know your question quite well and you know where you want to go with this. So now it's simply a matter of um, experimenting and seeing if that what you think you know is actually coming out in the data that you are analyzing. Okay, the second definition also mentioned four types of data analytics. And in what I've read about this, they often say that these are four levels of data analytics. And you will start with descriptive. And once you get more and more into your topic, you'll move to diagnostic, predictive, and, oh, sorry, you'll start with descriptive, move to diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive is sort of your highest level of data analysis. Um, and I would like to also have a look at the types of analysis a bit in more detail. So the lower level descriptive anal analysis, this is the first type of data analysis and it is the foundation of all data insight. It is the simplest and most common use of data in business. Now, the link that I got this from um, is very much a business analytics site, uh, but I think it still, uh, it still is very valid for us in the social sciences. Descriptive analysis answers the what happened by summarizing past data, usually in the form of dashboards. And I think this is also in our social sciences and specifically in my linguistics field. This is where you look, take a look at already created corpora or already available um, interviews with people. And you start to ask what happened surrounding your specific research question. Then when we move to diagnostic analysis, after asking the main question of what happened, uh, you start to dive deeper and ask, why did it happen? So this is, for instance, in phonology and phonetics, where you start looking at different processes by which people created pronunciations, for instance. Organizations make use of this type of analytics as it creates more connections between data and identifies patterns of behavior. When new problems arise, it is possible you have already collected data pertaining to the issue. And by having this data at your disposal, you it ends having to repeat work and makes the problems interconnected. Then moving to the two higher levels of analysis, predictive analysis, 
And this moves more to what is likely to happen. And this utilizes previous data to make predictions about future outcomes. Again, in my linguistics field, this is, for instance, when you start predicting the um, pronunciation, for instance, in language modeling, or when you start doing statistical modeling to do machine translation, and you, in fact, predict what the translation for a given word, given its context is. Then the higher, highest level prescriptive analysis. This is where you start making um, predictions on the course of action to take, given all of the analysis that you've done and all of the data that you've had at your disposal. Okay, so I, I know there aren't a lot of people in the group, but maybe we can, uh, or in the live session, but perhaps we can hear from those who are here. Let's discuss a bit the types of analysis that you most often prefer, uh, perform. I can maybe talk a little bit about how we use data about the escalator program. Um, so, for example, we have registration forms where people sign up to participate in events. Um, those registration forms have additional questions like which career stage you are at, um, where um, we are based, so which university you're affiliated with. And we use that information to describe the community that is involved in um, escalator events. Um, we also use that information diagnostically to look at who we are missing, um, making sure that we are spreading the word. And we, we notice even in today's session that there's definitely um, a large part of our community that is not yet aware of the activities that we are running. And that helps us to um, identify new causes of action, remedi remedial action. Um, and yeah, we can use that the same to make recommendations. Uh, so coming to prescriptive, you making recommendations about the, how to go forward. So that's a very, very simple data set. Um, it's very, very small data set. So not even big data um, or, you know, like machine learning or all that but you can already see how you can make use of that, um, even a very simple data set across these different types of analysis that you perform. I don't know if anyone else, and maybe in your, in your applied field or NEO from your studies, do you have anything to share? Um, I think um, with uh, my uh, masters, um, it's more, um, telling on what's being said in the community about um, my topic. And also, um, I, I'd also say I'm prescriptive, for example, in my outlook. Um, I'm hoping, because I haven't got there yet, <laughs> I'm hoping to um, share what can be done in order to sort of assist with um, the social problem that we are having with regards to um, the way language is being used and um, what people take from it and then sort of um, influences uh, their behavior. That's very interesting, Neil. I think um, most of us, when we start working with data, you sort of work through these different levels, like you also just mentioned. You start with the descriptive in maybe your first few chapters, and as you are just getting to grips with exactly what's happening in the community yourself, and as you move through your study, you end up getting too prescriptive anyway, because in your summary chapters, for instance, if you're doing a master's or a PhD, you do have to give some recommendations and basing this on your uh, diagnostic and predictive data is of course the best way to do that. So I think what you say about moving through the different levels, even in one study is very true. Anybody else who would like to share from their field of expertise, Anne? I sorry, just moving screens around. Um, yeah, I think I'm in my previous research. Um, it's kind of a combination of, of many of these. So if I think about, you know, I, was, I was predominantly in the life sciences, so terrestrial sciences, oceanographic sciences, did a lot of um, ecosystem research, climate change research, that sort of thing. So it's kind of a combination of 
of a lot of these sort of descriptive what's happening, why is it happening, the predictive part, what is likely to happen, um, and then also the prescriptive, I suppose, what, what we need to do. So it's kind of a, yeah, largely a combination of all of them, really. Um, but predictive is a big one to kind of to, to predict what's likely to happen as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, particularly, for example, with climate change research. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of a combination, really. It's good. To, yeah, it's good to kind of see these definitions of, of the different types. You kind of don't really think about that, that actually there's different different types of yeah, of analysis and, and why you do it and how you do it. Um, yeah, thank you for that. It's really good to see these definitions and to have it divided up into these different different bits. Okay, good. I'm glad you find um, having the terminology to describe what you are doing sort of intuitively with yep. moving through um, useful. That, that makes a lot of sense. Anybody else who'd like to share? I can maybe just also add that it's it's very interesting, um, as Anwisha is saying, if you're going from a life sciences background, I myself have worked across, uh, you know, several disciplines, you working in languages, um, these, these terminology um, and the, the steps are, you know, really transdisciplinary. So regardless of which discipline you're in, it's really um, good to know about these data analysis steps and to think about your data analysis um, and what you want to get out of it, because this also leads into how you do your data visualization, uh, what you put in your reports, which parts of your data you use for the different um, analysis. Um, and it's regardless of what discipline you're in. So it's really good to see this. Yes, that's very important that your um, if I can just go back to this slide with the different uh, steps if, or phases in the workflow that they speak to each other, that, that you, you might have to go back to the preparation phase uh, when your data sees something that you did not expect and you have to think again, but how does this fit into the, the bigger picture and uh, define and organize a different um, project? entirely maybe or a spin-off project from what you are doing uh, and I think that also ties in with what we've been saying this whole time that the process isn't you don't start a step when you finish a previous a previous one you sort of do continue in this workflow and moving between the different aspects uh, that comprise your workflow throughout the life cycle of any research project. Absolutely. And also, as you were saying, if you find in this analysis phase something that's unexpected, it's very important that you go back to your data collection phase and just see were you really subjective, uh, objective in, you know, when how you collected, did you really collect the data that you thought you were collecting? Yes. Or could there be bias introduced at the data collection phase either, even? Yes, and when I was still new at doing experiments with data, um, you sort of want to force it into the positive direction. You want to get the answer that you were expecting. And when you don't get that answer, often you are completely dejected and don't, do not want to continue. But no is also an answer. And getting something unexpected can lead very often to the most useful um summaries or the most useful analysis and predictions for what we can do in the future that might be completely different to what the status quo up to this point uh, in time has been and i think especially uh with the more qualitative studies that becomes very apparent where you uh, sort of you look at the data at first glance and you think you already know what you're going to see when you do your analysis. And when you don't see that, um, I think that is where the real, the real research and the real learning takes place. That's very true. Sorry, we're having a conversation here, but um, just yeah. thinking about that descriptive analysis phase where very often we want to immediately have a plot or a picture of what the data is saying 
but I remember from um, working in, in genomics data analysis as well, um, there, there's often not enough of a focus on data cleaning and um, data manipulation steps before you get to starting to interpret the data. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that ties in really nicely with what we're going to be doing later in this presentation with the open refine demonstration as well, showing how people can look at their data, really understand what their data is before you start interpreting results that pop out of visualizations um, and, and data summaries. And do you want to also, oh, yeah, no, your, your point when you said um, that no results are important as well, and that's a very, very important point because a lot of people they want to do their analysis and find these magnificently significant results that then they'll publish. And the journals are often after kind of these amazing wow factor results and significance and stuff. But it's really important to remember that not getting a significant result or what you might interpret as no results is really important too. Um, because that the data is always telling you something, whether it's showing you something significant or not. Yes. Um, yeah, so that's really, that was a really good point. That's very important to remember. All right, so to, to play around with data, you first need data. And now in different fields, this looks much different. Um, in my field, for instance, we often work with large corpora, uh, text corpora specifically, um, and this can take the form of Excel spreadsheets when they aren't that large, but also XML uh, files. It can take a format of SQL databases and so many other things. And I think each field has a few formats for the data that are sort of um, standard in that field. And in doing data collection, this is really acting on your data management plan that we also talked about in one of the previous sessions. So you, there are different standards and accepted collection methods also for different fields. Um, and I think it's important when you're doing your discovery phase and when you are reading to also take note of how others are collecting their data and what standards they are setting, because this is often something that, um, when you start doing your analysis, this needs to be in place. This is sort of the bedrock from which everything else builds, that you have solid collection, data collection methods, and that you can, that your research is uh, reproducible so that others can get exactly the same results if they follow the same data collection steps that you did. Uh, there are many considerations, and we've talked about a few of these based on your study specifically. Uh, so whether you are going to do qualitative versus, versus quantitative analyses, uh, whether you are using an existing corpus of text or speech, as in my field, whether you are going to set up questionnaires or do collection directly from respondents, uh, whether this will be a set of experiments and results that you get from those experiments that will all go to, into your data to be analyzed, uh, case studies, all sorts of different types of data should be collected according to the standards and accepted collection methods for the different fields. Now, some of you might have already um, come across ISO standards, and they all also exist ISO standards, and I'm not going to say too much about that because it's so specific for the different fields, um, but there are also ISO standards for data collection in very many fields. And this might be something uh, that you should look into and that should be for part of your discovery phase before you start doing uh, the physical work and before you start getting your data together so that you know what is expected of it. Something else that I want to mention is the metadata, metadata that we have to compile and that we have to collect with our data, our main data. So this is often described, uh, described as the data about data. And it can take a few, a few forms as well. The first being structural metadata. So this is describing the form. Um, for instance, if you are using with if you are using a corpus. Were there any abbreviations used? 
codes that you used, how your table setup works, what's in the rows, what's in the columns, um, and you'll see an example of that when we get to open refine as well. Uh, what variables is there in your data and how are they named and how are they described? Then also the reference metadata. So this is more describing the content specifically. Again, with protocols followed, methodology used in collecting your data. So you might want to um, reference specific experiments that you uh, did to collect your data. Uh, the purpose of this data, why was it collected? Um, how is it, what is its intended use and how it will be used in a specific study because, and we'll get to sh sharing of data in a minute, but you want to describe this very carefully because data collection is very often a costly and a time consuming affair. And if we can share our data and avoid someone else having to reinvent the wheel and having to spend time and money on collecting exactly the same thing, that is always our per uh, an external goal of data collection. So in describing the structural, the reference and the process metadata. So uh, when was this released, the licensing and the publications that relate to the data, someone else can very clearly see, is this something that I can also use in my study or was the process and the methodology followed to collect this data, not something that uh, works with the experiments or the research that I want to perform with it. So describing your metadata, spending some time in making this clear so that others can also use your data and get exactly the same results if they perform the same steps on it is very important. And more and more publication houses and um, journals and things are these days asking for this metadata and asking for specifically your data set to be released with your publication um, exactly because it needs to be reproducible, it needs to be um, open and clear exactly how you got your um, results. Then we've also talked about the FAIR data principles in previous session, uh, sessions. So your data needs to be findable, inter well, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So I'm not gonna say, too much about that. I think we've spent quite a bit of time on the fair data principles already, but it comes down to the fact that what you said, you uh, where you said you got the data, what you said you did with the data, and how others can use this data needs to be as open and clear as possible. All right, then moving on to sharing your data. And this sort of ties in with the ethical considerations that we quickly mentioned and also with uh, backing up, because if you share your data, then of course you can get to it again in future. Um, and the first thing that I want to mention here that we've already talked about a bit is the reusability of your data and the reproducibility of your experiments. And that it is important to consider these two aspects to grow the open science community and that it is also important for your own sake if you were to ever other experiment on the data that you've already spent money and time on collecting then it is important that it be in a format that is reusable for yourself as well. Um, licensing, I'm not going to go into too much detail but we all know that there are copyrights um, considerations to think about when you do want to share your data. And the most common licensing options are described under the Creative Commons licenses. And there's a whole website where you can look at all of the different um, Creative Commons licenses available. And they range from very open, which is the public domain dedication or CC0 license. Um, which is the first one mentioned here on the screen, to very closed and for a very specific group of people, which is the non-commercial um, data use. There are also different licenses or more um, the licenses that are uh, 
tailor made to your specific data where you perhaps want to make it available for research communities, but not for commercial use. Or perhaps you do want to make it available for commercial use, but people should not be able to uh, derive anything from it or to change your data in any way. There are different considerations based on your project, based on the ethical clearance that you also uh, got for your project. Of course, sharing um, questionnaires from respondents who are younger than 18 is also always going to be a problem and that should perhaps not be in the public domain uh, or CC zero. But for your own sake, um, if you just want to place your data on a repository for safekeeping, it might be very useful to also then look at more restrictive licenses so that you can share, but under very specific conditions. So I would definitely, when you are drawing up your data management plan, already have a look at the licensing and then definitely start with the Creative Commons license and see if there is uh, an existing license that you can apply to your data to make it safe and worthwhile for everyone to share. Now, the first place that I normally look at sharing my data because I work in the digital humanities is on the Sadilar repository. And uh, the link is available here in the slide if you click on repository. And I just have a screenshot here of what it looks like. I simply so searched for all resources available for Isim Debele. And you can see that there are um, a corpora, annotated corpora, a speech corpora, but that there are also some tools available on the Sadila repository for Isim Debele as well. So uh, Sadila really aims at making this repository a sort of a one-stop shop for language resources. And they can also help and assist you with the licensing agreements if you perhaps want to place a very restrictive or a very open um, agreement on your data. They can help and pick the best licensing agreement before sharing your data on the repository as well. They can also help package it in a way that others would be able to easily download and use your data. Um, so if you work in the digital humanities, then this is definitely a place that I would encourage you to look at for sharing your data. They also have a specific student data repository uh, where data sets collected in the course of any uh, type of, um, as you are an enrolled student, gets shared onto that repository specifically. Uh, so that's also very nice to be aware of. Then a different repository that you might already have heard of, especially if you work in more computer science um, fields, is GitHub. And GitHub is most used for sharing software and code, but can be used to share pretty much anything else. And the way GitHub is set up is that you make repositories or small folders, if I can call them that, for each of your projects, and you can share anything about your data on that in that folder. What makes GitHub very nice is that you can set folders to be shared privately. So only you have access, you create a profile, uh, which is free to do. Um, so on, if you set your folders to private, then only you have access to them. But you can also make them public and just like on Google Drive or Google Docs or those types of things, uh, you can set specific users that have access to these folders as well. So for instance, what you see on the screen here is a shared folder between myself, a few other colleagues, and a developer who developed some scripts uh, to do quality assurance on a large text corpus for us. Um, and you see here that we have everything for that one project together. We have the licensing agreement, we have the README file, uh, we have a little file with to-dos where we uh, discuss what steps still need to be taken to complete this project. We have the actual data that we are working with, and you can't see it on the screen there, but we also have a little file that we just called research ideas, uh, where if we come across something that might 
that we might want to turn into a research paper later on, you can just sort of jot down notes there and it's only shared between the people working on this project. So that's really useful also um, to know about. GitHub is also um, accessible in most parts of the world. Um, so it's a much safer uh, platform than some of the others to share files and folders and data with um, with each other. It can also be used quite nicely to do your own backups. So you can put all of your own data on your own GitHub profile. And um, you can, of course, store documents, data, spreadsheets, um, scripts that you might developed might have developed to work on your data, um, anything you can store in a GitHub repository and have access to it at any time. Oh, one other thing that I'll mention about GitHub is that it is also very nice with version control. Um, so if you are anything like me, my master's thesis, for instance, has, has a master's final one, master's final 1.1. Master's final, final, master's final, really final now, and all of these different versions of the same document. Um, and in GitHub, that can be automated for you as well. So each new, each time you save something new, it creates a new version rather than overwriting your previous versions. So the last section that I want to um, bring under your attention is the tools to perform analysis. And again, these are very specific to exactly what you want to do in your discipline um, or used by your collaborators, or as Tandeka has also mentioned, tools that your supervisors and members in your community already use and have uh, made you aware, aware of. Something else to consider is also the availability, whether the tools are free or through license, but I think we've talked about that in previous sessions. We've also mentioned interoperability previously when we discussed fair data principles uh, in which one tool does not necessarily work with a different tool and you should be aware of these challenges when you are designing your research output. Um, so if we were to um, put this into the research workflow picture that we've been working with, the whole time, uh, we are now in this the analysis phase. So traditionally, software like SBSS, which does this statistical analysis, was used. These days, we are working more and more with R, the R programming use, uh, language, because it is also a freely available language with much less uh, licensing fees and restrictions than SBSS, for example. Uh, but there are many others that, and your specific discipline will also have tools that are sort of considered uh, standard tools of the trade, depending on what you want to do with them. Something from my own field that I want to use, and you can have a look at it uh, through the link here at the top of the page, is buoyant tools. Now, those who work in linguistics and specifically corpus, analysis and corpus linguistics would know the name wordsmith tools very well and you will also know if you know wordsmith tools that their licensing fees are ridiculously expensive um, in our depart entire department we only have one computer uh, one laptop with wordsmith tools installed on it and only that one license for it and everyone has to sort of make turns to use that one laptop if you do want to use wordsmith because it is simply too expensive even for a university to afford giving it to everybody who wants to use it um, a recent development is the voyant tools and this is freely available and um, it does I want to say 99% of the work that you could do in wordsmith tools, you can now do for free in Voyant tools. So the way this works is I simply used the website that I put the link at the bottom of the slide there. I put it into Voyant tools and it gives me a complete analysis of the text uh, or as a tiny little corpus. 
So it draws a very nice visualization of the terms that are used in that corpus. Um, it gives the, I use the page for data analysis from Wikipedia. So it gives that uh, page as well, or the text extracted from that page. Uh, it gives the terms and the frequency on that page. Um, and in the bottom, it gives the collocations. It gives some statistics and summaries on that specific page. And you do not have to use websites in Voyant Tools. You can also upload your own corpora. So if you work in corpus linguistics or linguistics in general, and you often perform these types of analyses, I would definitely uh, consider having a look at Voyant Tools it works very easily. Uh, there are many tutorials on YouTube and elsewhere on the web available for it. And I would definitely have a look at it as a um, free and open tool to an analyze your data. Then if you do want to do more statistical analysis, I uh, also encourage you to have a look at R, the programming language R as an example. And you can have a look at this YouTube video. I don't think I'm going to play it now, but have a look at it on why R is becoming so popular and why it works so well. Then I also encourage you, there is an R for social sciences working group. And Analda, you have all of the details, but I think uh, they uh, join virtually once a month, if I have it correct. Yes, yeah, so we have a... Um co-working group where people can join and work on some coding learn coding work through your own um, work on your own learning path um, through materials that is relevant to you um, while you get some support within the group we meet um, every second wednesday for two hours but it's a very um and it's completely unstructured so you join when you can um, and you join for as long as you want. If you're going to come for an hour, two hours, half an hour, every week, every, uh, every second week or every month or whenever, every two months, um, there's not, you can't lose anything out because everyone is on their own learning journey. So, and there's also um, the same group also caters for Python. So Python and R or any other programming language that you want to do. Um, if you want to book out some time in your calendar, to dedicate uh, to learning or growing your programming skills, whether it's R or Python or something else, you're welcome to join us. And the information is on the website. I'll also share it. Yeah, yeah. So if you click on this, um, uh, uh, well, it's at a heading or whatever. Um, I've also linked the website to this, so you can get all of the information there. Um, the reason why I like R, and I'm also a beginner with it, I'm, I can't do much yet, is that you can do both your analysis, so you can draw your statistics, you can get your ANOVA tables or your regression tables from it, but then you can also directly in R do the visualization of those experiments. So you can draw a plot, you can get such nice visualizations in R, and this makes the next phase, the writing phase, just so much easier if you already have visualizations of the analysis that you have done in R. So I really like the fact that it's sort of a one-stop shop for anal analysis and visualization of your data, and I really like the fact that it is also an open source um, tool that you can use without any costs, and that it is there's an incredible community behind it. Um, I know there's also the R Ladies community, which is very active, and on any of the um, tutorial platforms that I've ever asked a question, everyone was genuinely nice. There were no snarky comments or um, why come here when you don't even know these basics. They really answered my questions um, factually, easily, and I could move on. So the R software itself and the R community are really user friendly. And I encourage you to have a look um, at those if you need tools to do analysis with. All right, then the next one that Analda is going to show us is OpenRefine. Um, so OpenRefine is a data 
cleaning tool that is often used, uh, data cleaning, data manipulation tool that is often used um, in data science, but it's um, almost an in between uh, between Excel and programming because it does have a, a graphical user interface, so you can point and click. You don't have to write code. But it keeps track of every step that you take in your data um, cleaning, um, data mani manipulation, um, and you can export all of those steps as a little program, which you can run again and again, which you can also share with your collaborators. So um, it looks like it runs on the web, but it doesn't run on the web. You install it on your local computer and it opens in a web browser. Um, so this software I have installed already on my browser. And what I'm going to be doing is just very, very briefly, um, let me put this in uh, the chat as well, very briefly share a few things that, that uh, one could do with OpenRefine um, based on the lesson from Data Carpentry for Social Sciences. So you have the link for that now. Um, it does show how to install the program and it, I will use the same data as this. So you, if, you, if we don't get through much, then you can continue to look at it and you can also try and reproduce what I'll show you now using, um, using the, the Open Refine for data uh, uh, for social science. So Open Refine, as I said, is, uh, is a useful tool because it's free, so no license cost, it's open source. So you know exactly, or you could see exactly what's going on, um, how the data is being manipulated. Um, you can contribute, you can request uh, functionality and, and it's been under development for quite a long time. It's still under active development. So it's, it's a really good tool to look at. Um, Using OpenRefine gives you a very good handle on what is happening in your data. So sometimes when you look in Excel, um, you might not really get a very good feeling for what's, what's happening in your data, but I'll show you a few things, especially in terms of um, formatting of specific columns, um, maybe lagging spaces or additional spaces in your, in your data, especially if you're working with text. Um, and a variety of other things that might not be that clear if you're working in Excel or if for that matter in another um, uh, spreadsheet program. Um, so the other thing that we have with OpenRefine is that it continues to save your data. So you never have to physically save it. It automatically saves all the time, oh, very regularly. So even if it crashed, what you did last would still be there. So um, I'm going to go and open the data set. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to load a CSV data set, but it does, uh, it is possible to read Excel websites and a variety of other, um, there's a very big list of things that it can read. Um, and this data set, as I said, is from the data carpentries, um, open refined for social sciences lesson. So you could also access it from there. So I'm going to, up, to import it. And what OpenRefine does is it gives you a preview of the data set. Um, and here you can make some settings. You can, you know, if, it, if it's not loading properly, you can tell it that it should ignore the first few lines or, um, you know, load only a certain number of rows or, look at um, which character to use to enclose um, column separators. Um, so you can, you can customize that here. Um, and just at the bottom here, you can also see um, loading a variety of, of files. So when I look at my data, it looks good. It, that, it did recognize the header column of the header line. Uh, my date looks good. Uh, the text looks good. Um, and the numbers are looking good as well. I'm going to um, change my project name to Open Refine Demo. And I'm going to create the project. So now what we have here is um, our tabular data set uh, showing all the columns. Uh, I can scroll here 
to get to all the columns. You can see that it's a very, very, it's a survey data um, from farming, um, ooh, I forget now exactly, but some uh, specific surveys looking at uh, province, district, ward, village, the year, year farming, are far, these farmers part of an agricultural association, how many members, um, and then it goes on to ask um, more specific questions about their um, living situations, um, their house uh, housing situations, um, and, and much more. So it's for those of you who are in the audience and familiar with survey data, this is an example of a survey data. Now, we can very quickly get a sense of our data by using what we call facets. Now, if you look at the diamond here, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with diamonds, but when a diamond is, um, so it is, ooh, I forget the English now. As it slipped, what's the word? Uh, refined, cut. Um, to get the optimal lighting from the diamond, it has these different sides to it. And you can see from the picture here, and those are facets. And the whole idea with Open Refine is that you can look at your data from, um, from different angles the, by using these facets. So we're quickly going to draw um, just for village, we're going to get a facet. You can see for each of these columns, there's a, a, a arrow, um, which you can click on and gives a drop down menu. And then there are a number of things that you could do with each of these columns. And what we're going to do very quickly is just to look at a text facet, which means obviously this, as you can see here, this column is um, contains text data, textual data. So we're going to create a text facet. And what that allows you to do is to see very, very quickly what type of information is contained in that um, column. And it's very much for those of you who have seen um, uh, um, pivot tables. This is a very, very quick way to get some of the data that you could have gotten from a pivot table very quickly. So you can see that there are eight options um, in that column. Um, some village names. Um, but you can see that there are clearly some maybe misspellings, uh, different types of spellings. And this number 49 is definitely not a village name. So you can very, very quickly see where the problems might be in your data for this column, especially if you, you know, as I said previously, if you just very quickly wanted to draw some uh, descriptive statistics on this and you said, oh, there were eight villages. But looking at this, you can clearly see that they weren't eight villages. There was maybe one, two, three villages. Um, based on the data that you look at here. Um, so you can do a variety of things. You can change your text here. Um, if, you, if you knew what the right village name was, clearly from, from this, if you, if you were working in this uh, field, you would know what the village names were. But from this, it looks like there's an O missing there. So I can edit straight away and apply it. Oh, did I make a mistake now? Mm, I did. Gerardo. Ger mm. There we go. So now what we've done is we have replaced that incorrect misspelled word in the data set. Um, I can also go to undo. Um, and here it shows me all the things that I've done. So you remember that I loaded the project and then I changed the village name. I made a mistake and then I changed it again to correct it. So I can go back to the first edit or I can go back to the raw data by just clicking on this. 
Um, and here you will see that I now have the original data set again. If I wanted to see if this is uh, indeed misspelled, I can go and look at only this. So I click on include here, and that will take me to show only this, this one data point. I can also include others. And here you can see I've got Gerdoza, Gerdoza and Gerardso. Um, and you can see that is definitely a misspelling. I can also go and edit it directly here. There we go. Um, uh, there we go. And now you can see that it's been updated. Um, again, if I look at Andy Redo, you can see there is the track record of what I've done. Um, so for every step that you take in your data cleaning, Open Refine keeps a record of every single thing that you've done. Um, and I'm just very quickly going to show you because I know we're out of time. If you go to extract, oops. Uh, so I can undo, redo. If I go to extract, oops, this isn't working. Anyways, um, sorry about this. I'm, I think we're running out of time here, so I'm not going to troubleshoot that now. But you can indeed um, download this little script and load the data again and apply. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I didn't get to show much about OpenRefine, but um, I hope that maybe in the co-working session at the end or at the end of August, we can maybe include some of the open refine and even maybe voyant. We can see if, if people are interested to get a more of a hands-on experience um, uh, and give you a more of an introduction to that. But in the meantime, we will in our summary emails share the links to the tools that Marissa was talking about, as well as these um, links to the uh, lesson that I was just going through um, that you can look at it yourselves. Um, so there's a, a little YouTube video that I've linked there to the goal of all of this analysis and that is to become a data storyteller and this guy really um, gives that goal very clearly and I, I like the way he expresses stuff so have a look make yourself another cup of coffee and look at that YouTube video and then I I think everybody knows now the different ways that you can stay connected, but there are also slides with the details on the uh, onboarding or recap sessions, the Slack channel, and all of the other things connected to Empower that you can have a look at. Then the next session uh, has a, will be focusing on tools for the writing phase of the research workflow, and that will be on the 11th of August, and the link to register is in that slide. Um, yeah, and then different contact people if you need any details. Um, you, my email address is also on the first slide, so you can are also you are also welcome to contact me if you have any specific questions or anything I said today. But yes, Anelda, I think the working session at the end of August will be very useful to uh, specifically have a look at some of the tools um, like Open and Refined and perhaps Voyant tools, and I will definitely be there. Right. Thank you very much, Mar much, Marissa, and thank you everyone for participating. Um, and Neo, um, Norma, and Tandekov also for um, giving your experiences and sharing some of the knowledge that you have. Um, the next session will be led by Neo, um, and we look forward to that. And we hope to see you in early August again.